You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is June 14, 2021, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, Immune Complexes and Complement in the Clinical Immunology Lab. Our presenter is Dr. Charles Barnes. He's a professor emeritus at Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. Okay. Well, we're going to we're going to talk about immune complexes in the complement system and we'll do a little background, but I'm basically going to come at it from the point of view of the clinical laboratory. So, uh, we're going to objectives are we're going to explore the nature of circulating immune complexes. We're going to look at some of the current and some of the historic tests for immune complexes and we're going to review uh common tests for complement and evaluating the complement system. Uh, I've got some questions there, but uh, I don't know if that's your the format still or not, but the uh, questions are circulating immune complexes can be precisely defined true or false. Uh, detection of circulating immune complexes is neither essential nor specific for any disease, and tests for evaluating complement include CH50, CH100, CH50 by enzyme immunoassay, or all of those. Um, so, you know, what is an immune complex? And that's a pretty hard thing to actually say because they're complexes and they can be bigger or smaller and all kinds of things. But basically, it's a clump of antigen antibody that is bound together and it's circulating rather than stabilized on a surface like a blood vessel or something like that. But you've got to think that there's got to be some equilibrium there. In other words, if you've got immune complexes that are bound, some of those can come loose and they would be circulating. And if you've got immune complexes that are circulating, some of those can deposit and become uh, uh, non-soluble. So, you know, you have to think there's an equilibrium there. They're basically separated because one is type 2 hypersensitivity and one is type 3 hypersensitivity. So your circulating immune complexes may be localized on tissue or they may be circulating. Um, they can also have, besides just antigen antibody, they can also have a lot of uh, complement things in there because you know, if you've got an antigen antibody um, couple there, uh, that, that's going to be mean there's an FC region sticking out. Of course, complement is uh, primed to bind to FC, FC and then uh, so you can bind, you know, start to activate your complement on an FC receptor, and things just kind of cascade from there. So you can imagine how uh, how it can be a, a really non-defined cluster of interlocking antigens and antibody for forming a large network of molecules. Um, classical assays for these clusters include Raji cell assays, uh, bovine conglutin assay. Conglutin is a complement of bovine serum that, that uh, tends to bind to these complexes. Uh, but mostly what people do is they do a C3 assay for uh, available C3 or they do a C1Q binding assay for, and uh, they're using multiple monoclonal antibodies in an enzyme immunoassay format. You can look at different kinds of complexes that come in and, and if you put the multiple monoclonal antibodies in there you can measure lots of uh, different kinds of complexes. Uh, at minimum the immune complex is a combination of antibody and antigen. Um, the reason you guys are interested in them is because they cause a lot of trouble. They get in the way. Uh, immune complexes need to be removed. And of course, they're going to be forming all the time, so they need to be removed all the time. And they need to, you need to keep them uh, from accumulating in the circulation and forming deposits around the body. And if you don't remove them promptly, you can have lots of problems. Uh, 
when everything works properly, immune complexes activate the classical complement pathway. Uh, you get some C3B formed. The, those attract macrophages. Um, it binds to complement receptors and FC receptors on these macrophages. And the mononuclear phagocyte system kind of comes in and chews them up. Uh, facilitates their removal. Also, you can uh, bind these to erythrocytes, and, and frankly, the erythrocyte binding is the main way of getting rid of these complexes. And so, if everything's working well, um, erythrocytes have FC receptors on them. They bind these immune complexes in the blood. They haul them down to the uh, to the spleen or the liver, where it's simply removed without even destroying the red blood cell. Uh, so they, you know, the erythrocytes are the main sponge for these uh, circulating immune complexes. Um, they, of course, are produced continuously, and they are a, they are associated with the type two, which would be a a fixed immune complex is or the type 3, which would be a circulating immune complex, uh, gel and Coombs uh, reaction. And the, remember the gel and Coombs, four types of, uh, of hypersensitivity reactions. And so type 2 reactions, the um, IgM and IgG antibodies and antigens are um, on a cell surface. And they are they are bound to something associated with that cell surface. It may be bacteria. It may be lots of other things. Whereas in the type three reaction, the immune complexes are formed against circulating antigen. But still, you know, once they become bound, all of these things can attract neutrophils and can attract some really, um, really serious uh, killing cells. And so. Uh, if you've got these neutrophils releasing all their nasty uh, mediators at a, in a particular location, you're going to get a lot of inflammation, you're going to get tissue damage, and you're going to get lots of other bad things going on. Um, I had a couple of videos that I, I normally show in this, and I checked last night, and these videos are no longer supported, at least on my computer. Uh, I think these videos came from Dr. Belante's book on immunology. But this one shows uh, basically a neutrophil attracted to an immune complex that's uh, fixed to the wall of a blood vessel and all the enzymes that are released uh, to do damage there. And the next one uh, is a picture of complement. And this is what complement looks like once it gets fully activated and you get the C5 through nine uh, membrane attack complex going, and basically it just forms a little donut in, the, uh, in, a, in a cell wall, and it doesn't have to be a bacterial cell wall. You know, it can be an erythrocyte cell wall, it can be a, uh, a lymphocyte cell wall, it can basically be any, any cell wall that uh, the complement decides it, it likes and wants to, uh, wants to attack. And, of course, once you punch a hole in the cell wall, you can either, you know, if the contents of the cell are in a lower osmotic pressure than the exterior, you get a lot of, uh, a lot of fluid flowing in. And if they're a higher content than the exterior, you get a lot of stuff flowing out. And so uh, I remember I first saw the electron micrograph of these pictures at the International Congress of Biochemistry in Toronto, Canada in 1978. And it was a really impressive uh, electron micrograph of a, a cell surface that had been uh, basically invaded by these complement, activated complement protein complexes. And you can imagine how uh, these things can cause a lot of trouble if they're in the wrong place. And they can do a lot toward destroying uh, unwanted bacteria and, and things like that. 
uh, if they're in the right place. So uh, anyway, about the removal of immune complexes, uh, red blood cells have complement receptors on them, CR1 receptors, and bind these circulating immune complexes. Uh, this complement receptor 1 on red blood cells and other cells too, uh, it serves as a main system for processing and clearing um, opsonized or bound to complement immune complexes. Uh, normally, they're removed from the bloodstream uh, in the spleen by specialized liver cells without destroying the red blood cell. But you can imagine the trouble that would be caused if uh, all of a sudden the body decided that, well, I'm going to get rid of these immune complexes, but I'm going to rip them off the red blood cell and destroy the red blood cell too. And so you can imagine the, the um, uh, anemia that would be built up there. Uh, if you don't clear these things, however, they get trapped in all kinds of, of vulnerable places. Uh, one especially uh, is the kidney and lung, skin, and other places. Uh, specific location depends on their complements. On, I mean, on their, their, their com composition, but wherever they are, they're going to attract lots of really angry cells, uh, neutrophils mostly, and they're going to cause a lot of problems, uh, tissue destruction and everything that goes along with it. So here's some of the players uh, in immune complexes. You can, and I'm guessing you guys can see my arrow here. Is anybody still out there? Yes, we can see it. Okay. Uh, so you you know you got on cells, and on the cell you can have a CD3 receptor, you can have a FC receptor, and so this is where the Raji cell comes in. There, we'll talk about it in a minute. But uh, Raji cell is basically a derived uh, uh, immortal set of a subset of lymphocytes that has mostly CD3 receptors and zero or very few FC receptors. And so if you take a Raji cell and mix, your, mix these Raji cells with blood from a, an individual, a serum from an individual who uh, might have circulating immune complexes, and then you measure the amount of IgG or IgM this Raji cell has attracted. Uh, if it has attracted any amount of antibody, it's attracted it because of the binding to the C3D receptor by the circulating immune complex. And so this, the Raji cell was one of the first uh, assays around for circulating immune complexes. Um, you can also you also have like a C three B receptor on a neutrophil. So neutrophil's got a lot of receptors on it that can bind to these immune complexes. Uh, platelets, red blood cells have uh, red blood cells have a CR one receptor. Platelets, of course, have an FC receptor on them, and other cells have FC receptors. And so you can see there are lots of of uh, players in this, and it can be a really complicated system, and, and you don't know, I mean, it's really difficult to tell where the breakdown is occurring if you're, got, if you're having problems clearing these immune complexes. And one of the immune complexes, of course, could be rheumatoid factor, which is an, an antibody against uh, nuclear material, uh, mostly uh, maybe something like double-stranded DNA. And so, even though lots of uh, problem situations like lupus or rheumatoid arthritis and things like that will have circulating immune complexes, they're not necessarily uh, diagnostic for anything in particular. They would serve more to support a diagnosis or something like that. And so this is a just a quick review of the type 2 antibody-mediated uh, hypersensitivity reaction and the type 3 antibody-mediated hypersensitivity reaction. Uh, and basically the difference here is whether the immune complexes are mostly localized or circulating. Uh, so if you want to test for these circulating immune complexes, 
Um, we, and we test for them in different kinds of, of diseases, uh, in rheumatological and autoimmune diseases, um, some allergic diseases. I guess uh, uh, I can't think of anything in specific right now. Uh, viral, bacterial, parasitic, parasitic diseases, malignancies. But detection of circulating immune complexes is neither essential nor specific for any disease. These things are very nonspecific. And for that reason, testing for circulating immune complexes is generally not commonly done in the clinical laboratory, not nearly as much as it used to be done. Um, because the laboratories have sort of cut out testing that is not specific for a disease process. In other words, if your, your testing is not really diagnostic for any particular disease process, the laboratory will question whether or not you really should be doing that test. And the um, places like Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, the payers, will also question the laboratory as to the validity of this test and whether or not they're going to get paid back for it. So a lot, uh, you know, it sort of all, all bleeds down from the top. It may provide useful clinical information, uh, and it can be used as a supporting, uh, supporting information and things like that. But again, it, it in itself is not going to diagnose any particular disease process. Uh, but these you know, the measurements are out there and, and uh, people will ask. So here are some of the methods available for measuring circulating immune complexes. Uh, you know, since they're protein and they're in serum uh, you, and they're a little heavier than serum, not quite as heavy as cells sometimes, sometimes heavier than cells, you can centrifuge these circulating immune complexes out, uh, especially if you put a little polyethylene glycol in there to change the viscosity of the serum. Uh, you can change it so that either the immune complexes will go to the top or go to the bottom. And uh, so, you know, this can be done. Uh, so you can isolate these things if you want to play with them in the laboratory but it doesn't really help you much because they are so sort of nondescript uh, and the components of them are well known. Uh, of course, I don't know of a single clinical laboratory that has an analytical centrifuge available. So that's really not the way uh, people go. Uh, you can sort of get an idea of the circulating immune complexes by looking at their interaction with complement. And so if you do a complement uh, sort of overall complement measurement and see that complement is being like a, you know like a C3 assay or something like that, and see if your complement is being consumed, you can pretty much guess that yeah, uh, there may be some circulating immune complexes consuming this complement, and then when the circulating immune complexes get removed, the complement gets removed, and if it's getting removed faster than it's getting produced, then you're going to see complement consumption, the complement consumption picture. Uh, but mostly you can take something like C1Q, uh, maybe C1, maybe in the older days we would take an iodinated 125 attached to C1Q and do a binding assay on it. And so if you precipitated out a lot of C1Q, and you measured it by how much radioactivity it had on it, you could get an idea of the circulating immune complexes. Uh, we don't do so much uh, radioactive assay in the clinical laboratory anymore. So because you've got to dispose of this radioactivity, and it lasts a long time. It can be very expensive to dispose of. So now we've developed a C1Q ELISA, so you can uh, measure uh, how much C1Q is attached to uh, some sort of immune complex system that you might uh, put in a microtiter well or something like that. And so from this, you can get a good indication of the circulating immune complexes. Um, also, 
you can measure FC um, receptors, how, mu how much uh, FC receptor you might have there. Um, you can do this by watching platelet aggregation or by watching the inhibition of rosette formation. And these little things over to the side here are rosettes. So Dr. Barnes, I think you're breaking up a little bit. Okay. That sounds better. Uh, all right. That's Yeah, I see right now I'm a little low on the cell phone. So anyway, you can, uh, you can measure this by looking at the rosettes here, uh, but you have to add the right um, coated red blood cells to get this rosette formation. It's really a, it's really a very skillful laboratory procedure, and, and I don't know of a single clinical laboratory that really does that anymore. Uh, or you can do a Raji cell uh, test, and this Raji cell test, again, uh, basically you take Raji cell as a cell line that has a lot of C3 rece uh, receptors for C3 on there and no real FC receptors. And so if you put these Raji cells in with patient sera and then separate them out somehow, either by radioimmune acid precipitation or by immunofluorescence or by flow cytometry and measure its stain for IgG attached to these Raji cells, if you find a lot of IgG t attached to the Raji cells, then you know pretty much that they came, that this IgG came from circulating immune complexes. And uh, this for a long time was a, a very common way of measuring circulating immune complexes, but it has again sort of fallen out of, out of favor because the test really just is not done that much anymore. Um, the C1Q binding test is the one you'll generally see available, and basically what you do is you take a take the C1Q fraction of complement and you coat it to this. The blue thing over here on the side is a single well in a microtiter plate, which is how most people these days do enzyme immunoassay. Although many of the uh, automated machines in the clinical laboratory have different, you know, kinds of of uh, coating mechanisms and different. They see what you coated onto different things. This microtiter plate make, it makes a good learning tool because you can look at what's happening in an individual well. And so, if you've got C1Q coated on here, the C1Q of course has a receptor for immunoglobulins and complement factors. And then if you stain for immunoglobulins and complement factors, you can actually get a measurement of how much material you've got in the serum that might bind to C1Q. And this probably uh, is going to be a circulating immune complex. And so if you get a high measurement on a C1Q binding assay, you can estimate that you've got a significant amount of, of circulating immune complexes. And also, you can look at different uh, complexes in particular, because if you build monoclonal antibodies to C3 and C3 fragments, and you coat those to the microtiter plate, you can pick up specific, basically, immune complexes. You can pick up where you've got C3B attached to immune globulins, where you've got C3B attached to IgA or IgM, where you've got uh, C3B and C3D attached to IgG, and different combinations of this. And so you can also do some anti-C3 assay to give you another idea of how much circulating immune complexes there are. Uh, if you ordered something like this, uh, Children's Mercy would not do it 
in their own laboratory, they would probably send it up to Mayo Clinic, or uh, if Mayo Clinic didn't do it, they might even send it out to um, to Utah or, or some specialized laboratory that, that ran this assay. And so this is probably not something that you're going to order frequently and not something that you're going to uh, see um, in uh, lists of results very frequently. The value of this these days is more in sort of under using it as an understanding tool about how C3 or how circulating immune complexes actually are put together and work. Uh, so the assay techniques, uh, pretty much if you're going to see this, you're going to see it as a C1Q ELISA or an anti-C3D ELISA. Those are nice, uh, sensitive, and specific, fairly specific tests. And they're very practical to do in the laboratory. Uh, the Raji cell test uh, was still pretty, you know, it was a pretty good test at the time. However, it's very time consuming and, and difficult to, to really make it work. Uh, There's some other tests, older tests out there like the conglutin test and the rheumatoid factor uh, that really don't work quite as well. But um, you really don't see a whole lot of this type of testing these days unless you um, unless you're part of a, a big rheumatology practice or something like that. Uh, and they generally, a lot of those big rheumatology practices do their own specific laboratories. <clears throat> so from there, let's, let's shift to complement. Uh, you guys have gone over complement uh, in a boss probably by now, and so know a lot, uh, a lot about how it works. But basically, complement serves, you know, its basic purpose is to punch a hole in the membrane. And so if it gets activated and you start with the C1QRS and then you get C4 split into uh, active C4 and inactive C4, the active products will go on and split another molecule like C3. The inactive products serve as chemotactic factors and they attract neutrophils and things like that. And so complement is one of these proteolytic enzyme-based amplification systems. In other words, once it gets triggered, once it gets started off, it really starts to go. Now, there are lots of inhibition factors out there that kind of shut it down outside of the local area because complement activation is something you want to have localized. You, you know, a, a non-localized complement activation is, is really, really serious. So a complement's one of these things you want to have go on with a big bang like a firecracker in one particular area, uh, but localized to that area. Anyway, the cascade runs on different pathways, uh, classical, alternative, and, and the lectin pathway, and, and probably other, uh, you know, the, actually the interacting active uh, components between complement circulating immune complexes and the kinin system is really complex and can be really uh, difficult to understand. Uh, of course, one way of measuring complement is to measure each of these components in the blood, and you can measure C3, C4, uh, C2, even C5 through 9 uh, if you want, and look at the individual components. But generally, each of the complement, uh, generally what you want to know is, is does this person have a functioning complement system? And okay, we're talking about the uh, sheep red blood cell, and uh, we used to get a routine uh, shipment of sheep red blood cell from a local supplier uh, many, many years ago, and we had to treat, you know, we had to, to uh, heat treat them to get rid of the complement or, or, or we had to uh, clean them up in different ways and then we had to put on uh, rabbit anti-sera, uh, anti rabbit anti-sheep that had been heat treated to destroy complement and uh, coat those cells and then you'd, uh, we'll skip down to the actual setup of the assay. Um, you'd basically set them up uh, 
in either test tubes or plastic uh, micro titer plates. And basically, you uh, to one, you added the sheep red blood cells and water, and that would lyse all the red blood cells. And um, that would be your 100% signal. And for one of them, you would simply add a buffer that contained, that was set up to not lyse the sheep red blood cell, and that would be your, your zero signal. And then you would add your buffer and different, amount, uh, different amounts of the serum to be tested to a series of wells. And when you got to the point where you lysed 50% uh, of the available red blood cells in there, you were at your CH50 point. And so if the serum had lots of complement in it, then you reached that point very early. And if the serum had no complement in it, then basically you didn't reach that point. You didn't lyse any red blood cells. And so it was a, a good way of determining how much uh, uh, complement activity or complement ability a person had. Uh, that's actually, though, you know, that actually took quite a lot of doing in the clinical laboratory. Uh, so there have been several uh, developments since. The one is the CH50 by enzyme immunoassay, and it involves, and I'll go ahead and skip to that uh, uh, thing. It, it, this, we send these to Mayo Clinic now, and so they make uh, uh, basically they make lip liposomes, uh, artificial little mem little cells uh, surrounded by a lipid membrane that are labeled with dinitrophenol, and then you activate the you know you put put serum in there, you activate that serum, and it punches holes in this artificial membrane. And so they're inside the membrane is glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase, and you've got glucose 6-phosphate and NAD in the mixture. And so you start to uh, get uh, reduced, or you got to start to get NADH, and you can measure this NADH on a spectrophotometer. And it uh, basically mimics the CH50 which you used to do on sheep red blood cells, but these artificial membranes, uh, you can keep around for a lot longer time, and you don't have to worry about maybe uh, for a year they've been using the same sheep and something happens to that sheep, and they you now use another sheep and the cells don't lyse as well. So it's a much more standardized assay, uh, and this is kind of a, a cartoon of it. Where you, you've got an artificial membrane, and an enzyme on the inside, if you, you coat this artificial membrane with IgG, you put complement in there, it gets activated, you punch holes in the membrane, the enzyme leaks out, or the NAD leaks in, and the enzyme converts it to NADH, which gets in the system, and you measure this by spectrophotometry. And so for this, you can sort of, you can set up a, a 0 to 100 scale or a 0 to 50 scale whereby you um, you can tell how much complement uh, this serum has related to other sera that, that you might use for a standard or related to 100% of the cell lysis. And so this actually uh, complement, you know, this complements, this actually works pretty well uh, and correlates very well with the standard uh, CH50 method, and so this is the one that most laboratories use now. And basically, uh, they've substituted an artificially made uh, membrane uh, reagent for the old sheep red blood cells that we used to use. And so, um, I think that's our last slide. No, these are all, yeah, and, and so... I wanted to also say that there are enzyme immunoassays available for just about every one of the complement cascade proteins. Uh, most of the time, if your functional assay is not adequate and you su suspect it's a genetic problem, 
then you go in and you do these things one at a time until you come up with the specific uh, complement cascade pathway protein that might be deficient in any one uh, case. And so that, that's our presentation. Does anybody have any questions? If I'm still on. Oh, you're still on. Okay. Um, so, you know, lot, lots of this is, is historic stuff, but it's the kind of stuff that you might get a peripheral question on on your board exams. And I think this this t exact title uh, still appears in the uh, suggested outline for uh, fellows presentations. Uh, and if it's changed, Paul can let me know and I'll change the presentation. So anyway, so if there are no questions,